Welcome to the NCDPI World Language Quarterly Update. This is our second quarterly update for this school year. And this webinar includes information relevant to all of our world language programs, including details for specific programs, updates on international, national, regional, and state initiatives, and information to be shared with world language teachers on topics like proficiency, course codes, um, evaluation, and implementing our world language essential standards in general. All K-20 World Language administrators, teachers, and instructors are always welcome, and every school is encouraged to have at least one World Language educator attend these webinars so that information can be shared locally. Today's agenda is coming up on screen. We are going to start with just a welcome and overview. And then we have a section on news to use. Today we have news, uh, national news, regional news, and state news to share. Our spotlight for today is on the AP or Advanced Placement World Language Exam results and resources from the College Board. And we'll end with reminders and resources and answer any additional questions that we have at the end of the hour. As I said before, my name is Anne-Marie Gunter. I'm your World Languages Consultant. I always post pictures because we know, those of us who work online, that um, having a visual for participants on a webinar or broadcast is important. Um, also today for the spotlight, um, I thought I was going to have one of our AP uh, World Language uh, College Board colleagues join us like we did in last year's second quarterly update. However, they were not available, but they sent their materials on, and so um, we are hearing from them, if you will, uh, and especially from the November 16th session that they did at the ACTFL convention just a few weeks ago. All right, let me take a look at any questions. I do see a question. Um, someone's asking about um, what K-20 means uh, versus K-12. K-20 simply means that the information I'm sharing here could be applicable to everyone who teaches world languages, whether that's K-12 um, in a school, uh, um, elementary school, a middle school, or a high school, uh, or up to grade 14, let's say, at a community college, or even up further at a four-year university or graduate education. Um, so that's the 20, it's the graduate education level. All right, looks like that's all of our questions. This is our agenda for today. I think we can finish up within the, an hour, and that would be all, our goal. To start out, I like to do poll questions um, during our broadcast. The poll question feature is part of GoToWebinar, although there are many online tools that work in a similar fashion to get audience participation. I'm going to go ahead and ask you, as any teacher would, what are your goals with today's lesson or webinar? So um, are you a teacher leader sharing information with a colleague? Are you an administrator gathering materials for local presentations? Are you an educator earning a contact hour for licensure renewal? Are you an individual getting a question answered? Or do you want to remain anonymous on a Wednesday afternoon? So what I'll do is go ahead and launch our question. It should show up on your screen, and you can just click on the answers that apply to you. You can select all that apply on this one. And I'll go ahead and take a look at any questions we have in the question box. All right, let's take another 10 seconds and finish up our voting. Go ahead and make your decisions. You can choose more than one if that's what works best for you. All right, thank you for that. And what I'll do is close our um, poll and then show you the results so that we can talk about them. There we go. All right, well, it looks like almost everyone, well over half of you are here because you're an educator earning a contact hour for licensure renewal. Contact hours to accumulate for a CEU can be earned by those who participate in the live broadcasts of webinars in the World Language Webinar Series. Today's webinar is one hour long, so one contact hour or 0.1 CEUs can be earned. Please save the email receipt you receive from the GoToWebinar system to document this contact hour towards the CEU for licensure renewal. Also note, you'll get a receipt that says that, and you'll get a certificate this year because that's a new functionality within GoToWebinar. 
it will come to the email address that you have registered for the webinar in. Um, on that email receipt and certificate will be a note that says this is a content activity for world languages. Someone had asked earlier, will this count for Spanish renewal? The answer is yes, because this is a content activity for world languages and that encompasses all the languages that, that we teach here in North Carolina, which numbers uh, up to 18. Also, there'll be a note that says local LEAs or districts or charter schools must approve professional development offerings because some of our districts and charter schools have um, you know, rules and, and guidance on what professional development can be used for licensure renewal and others are much more um, liberal on that. So please check and make sure when you are saving your certificate and, and email receipt from today's broadcast. I also see that a good number of you are here because you are teacher leaders sharing information with colleagues and I wanted to remind you that a recording is being made of today's webinar and that archive along with the slides and any handouts or anything we have will be available for local training approximately one week from today. Uh, these materials can be used as professional development resources locally uh, and you can even document contact hours uh, in your district or school if you're using them after the, the live broadcast today. That's up to you. All right, we also have some folks who said they're here um, because they're an administrator or an individual getting a question answered, so I hope that this works well for you. And we've got a few people who said they just want to remain anonymous on a Wednesday afternoon. I certainly understand that. All right, let's go ahead on into our national and regional news to use for you. There are three main items I want to share today. The first is the actual 2019 call for proposals. It's a national call. Also, I want to talk about our seal of biliteracy, which is in over 30 states now. And then I want to talk a little bit about our SCOLT conference registration and the fact that that's opened for us here in the southeast. First up is the actual call for proposals. Each year, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, or ACTFL, our national professional organization, has an annual convention. Uh, the 2019 convention will be in Washington, D.C. on November 22nd through the 24th. The ACTFL convention is always the week before Thanksgiving. The goal of the ACTFL annual convention is to provide a comprehensive professional development experience for language edu educators of all languages and levels. Proposals um, are, are needed to address uh, today's learners and educators by focusing on innovative programs, emerging trends, and research-informed practices. Um, presentation types that you can propose include what you see there on the screen, so 45-minute sessions or roundtables, as well as 15-minute paper sessions that are either practice or research-oriented, or even an electronic poster on, a, on research you've done or a project that you've done. So please consider um, submitting something to share with other world language educators. The call for proposals deadline is Friday, January 11th at basically midnight um, in our time zone. All proposals are submitted online, and there are a number of um, details about that. There are the instructions and documents like the submission guidelines and presenter responsibilities that have um, additional information for you to submit a proposal. By the way, I should also mention some of the things you hear me saying, um, and certainly all of the links that we would have on the slides that take you to the information we're talking about are in the notes section of the slide and so you can get those afterwards and um, quickly access them as you need. Also in our news to use both nationally and regionally is information about the seal of biliteracy. The seal of biliteracy is an award given in recognition of students who've studied and attained proficiency in two or more languages by high school graduation. The seal of biliteracy takes the form of a seal or endorsement that appears on the transcript or diploma of a graduating senior and is a statement of accomplishment for future employers and college admissions. The seal of biliteracy is currently in over 30 states. On the map you see of the U.S. there, the uh, states that are colored in in uh, darker blue are the ones that have a seal of some kind. Most states have a state-level seal, just like North Carolina does and, and our neighbors here in the southeast, but some um, states have specific seals that, that go with a district or our community within that state. You can get all that information by going to the Seal by Literacy website that's linked here and on the map, 
Um, and you can actually click on each state individually and find out about their approved state seal. Or if they're appearing in a green color there, it, it's under consideration. You can find out about their process in, in place. And those that are in kind of a tan color are in the early stages of looking to seal it by literacy. So that's something that you can catch up to when you need to. We are happy to share with you that, of course, North Carolina has a seal of biliteracy and has had since January of 2015. Um, our neighbors have gotten their own seals. Uh, Virginia got theirs starting in March of 2015, so not too long after us. Georgia got theirs in May of 2016. And Tennessee and South Carolina have recently gotten theirs this year, uh, most notably with South Carolina getting theirs last month in October. So you can read the details about that if you would like. I did also want to share with you a little bit of the data regarding North Carolina's seal of biliteracy, which is called our Global Languages Endorsement. Um, it's called that because we already had other diploma endorsements that students could earn prior to getting our seal of biliteracy, and so it was made the fifth uh, diploma endorsement that graduating seniors could earn, but it is our seal of biliteracy. One thing I like to share is the data we have about any kind of program or initiative so that you can use that as you need to. Um, I did say we got our seal of biliteracy starting in January of 2015, so the class of 2015 was the first group of seniors who could earn it. You'll notice that we have their graduation year, the total number of global language endorsements that were earned that year by students, and the percentage of graduates for the whole state who earned our seal of biliteracy. We also have broken that down by graduates from high schools in districts or charter schools. And so you can see that the first three years when this system um, was in place but information had to be entered manually into PowerSchool, we averaged a little over a thousand or right at a thousand uh, graduating seniors who were earning our seal by literacy and that represented anywhere from one to about two and a half percent of the graduating seniors in North Carolina. Just this last school year for the class of 2018, the process of identifying students who had earned the seal of by literacy within PowerSchool became automated and this allowed um, the system to check who had earned that and to start awarding those and making sure everything went on everyone's transcript. And so you see in 2018 we had over 9,000 students who had earned our seal of biliteracy, the Global Languages Endorsement. This represented 9% of our population of graduating seniors in the state. And you'll see that the number of districts uh, as well as charter schools and the percentage of them uh, increased dramatically. Please keep in mind as you're looking at those that data, um, especially regarding our districts and charter schools, that not every school in a district or not every charter school uh, has a high school or offers um, language instruction up to the level you need in order to earn the seal of biliteracy. We are going to talk more about the seal of biliteracy, our global languages endorsement, um, in an upcoming webinar. And so we'll go into details about how students can earn the seal of biliteracy, how many languages they can earn it in, uh, what the process is, and a little bit about um, the data we have here and what we want to do moving forward. So if you're interested in knowing more about that, please plan to attend the December 5th webinar just a week from today um, in our Measuring World Language Proficiency series. The focus of that webinar is on credentialing, and we will, like I said, be looking at our global languages endorsement, our seal of biliteracy. All right, next up is some news to use regionally. Uh, I wanted to share with you that the Southern Conference on Language Teaching, or SCOLT, conference will be on March 21st through the 23rd uh, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, not too far away from us. The Foreign Language Association of North Carolina, or FLANC, is one of the three partners with SCOLT this year uh, hosting that. So the SCOLT 2019 conference will replace the FLANC Spring Conference this year. They will be one and the same. SCOLT registration is open and you can register for pre-conference workshops, um, the conference itself where there's going to be over 150 sessions, and please note that registration includes two breakfasts at the conference on Friday and Saturday, and the Friday Awards Luncheon where the 2019 SCOLT Teacher of the Year will be named. Also, please know that various registration rates are available. Um, if you're a presenter at SCOLT, and I know we have a, a number of North Carolina 
teachers and administrators who are going to be presenting. The uh, registration discount of $150 is available until the end of this week, November 30th. And then after that, there is still an early bird discount for others through March 1st of $175. If you're a full-time undergraduate student or if you know someone who is, they can register for a very reduced rate. And there's also Saturday-only registration for those who cannot attend during the week. So that's something to think about. And as I said, this is the conference that will replace our spring state conference that we typically have on a Saturday. So we're going to be, uh, as a state, as Flank, um, helping to host that. I see a couple questions about this, so let's stop a moment and talk about that. Um, somebody wants to know, what does SCOLT stand for? SCOLT stands for Southern Conference on Language Teaching, S-C-O-L-T. Um, the Southern Conference is one of five regional conferences in the state um, that also works towards um, ACTFL um, and that Teacher of the Year at ACTFL too. But um, it, it, it encompasses over a dozen states in the southeast as well as the U.S. Virgin Islands, which is a territory of the United States. I also see someone that says, um, does the registration include the hotel? It does not. Um, however, if you go to the registration page where you would um, pay and submit your registration online, there is information about hotel and other lodging options, uh, as well as about travel and the area in general around Myrtle Beach. I would encourage you to take a look at that and also encourage you, if you've not thought about it before, uh, about submitting a proposal for next year's SCOLT when that information becomes available. All right. I do see someone who's also asking, is it possible to earn CEUs at SCOLT? And who would give the certificates? Yes, it is possible to earn CEUs at SCOLT. That's something that, that most of our state, regional, and national conferences do in order to help teachers with their licensure renewal. Um, Whoever is hosting the professional development gives the certificates, and so SCOLD, as, a, as an organization, would be responsible for giving those certificates. It's likely that that information will be part of the information you receive as a participant if you do decide to go to SCOLD. All right, great. I don't see any other questions at this time, so let's go ahead and move forward. I also have some news to share with you about from the state level. Um, those of you familiar with our wiki, our World Languages wiki that we use, please know that Wikispaces uh, as a company is going out of business. So Wikispaces that we have will be transitioned to Google Sites by January of 2019. I want to assure everyone that the World Languages wiki and its contents plus the lingua folio content that we have on the NC Folios wiki will be on our new World Languages website which will be available in January of 2019. Also, if you're involved with dual language immersion or DLI programs, all of the uh, information from that wiki and its contents, likewise, will be on the new NC DLI website. And as I said, those will be Google Sites. We have a few more state updates to share. The NC DPI dual language immersion or DLI team is expanding to include additional colleagues to support secondary immersion continuation programs. For those who may be new uh, to the idea of dual language immersion, dual language immersion is one of our world language programs. It's in our state standards, of course, and it's an opportunity for students to learn a language through content. So they're actually in an immersion program where they're learning things like math and science, but in a language other than English. They also get English instruction, so students become biliterate uh, and bilingual through these programs, and most of them start in kindergarten. In North Carolina, we have had tremendous growth in DLI programs, and as they grow from K-5 schools into middle schools and high schools, we've seen the need to add, as I said, additional colleagues to support our secondary immersion continuation programs. And so we are adding um, a representative from advanced programs like AP, Advanced Placement, and IB, International Baccalaureate. We're also adding an English language arts colleague to think about English uh, proficiency with those programs. Uh, someone from Healthful Living who knows quite a bit about health and physical education coursework. We have a STEM colleague coming on board for science, technology, engineering, mathematics information, and a social studies colleague. In addition, we are um, reactivating the North Carolina DLI Advisory Board. This is a group uh, that is representative of all of our NCDLI programs across the state by educator role, so teacher, um, coach, 
administrator, and etc. Uh, as well as grade levels or grade spans. Um, the languages, there are eight different languages we do with dual language immersion instruction in North Carolina now, as well as program models, either one-way or two-way immersion. Applications to join the team, because we kind of need to restock, if you will, for some of our folks, were submitted through November 21st. That was last Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving. And those applications are currently being reviewed. For additional details on all things with dual language immersion, come to the DLI quarterly update webinar on December 11th at 4 to 5 p.m. December 11th is actually a Tuesday, but at the same time as we're talking today. And we'll, be, um, we'll have a spotlight on new DLI programs K-12 and how to start them. So that's coming up if you're interested in that. All right, well that brings us to the end of our news to use section of this uh, webinar. So I'm, we're at another poll question. I want to ask you, which of the news items will you use or share first? And by using or sharing, you decide what that means for you. Is it going to be the actual call for proposals? that are due January 11th? Is it going to be the sealed by literacy information? Is it going to be the scope conference registration details? Is it going to be the transition to the new NCDPI Google Sites? Or is it going to be updates on our uh, DLI team and advisory board? I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll so you can respond to that. Remember, you have to choose just one for this one because it's which one you'll use or share first. You can go ahead and do that, and I'll take a look at our questions box. All right, let's take about 10 more seconds. Go ahead and choose which news item you'll use or share first, the very first one. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close our poll and then share the results with you as well as some questions that have come up. All right, it looks like the item that's getting shared uh, first the most will be the transition to the new NCDPI Google Sites, and that's great. As I said, they should be available starting in January. Not too long to wait. Also, about a third of you said you're going to share the seal of biliteracy information, including our North Carolina Global Languages endorsement data. And that's very good. There's a lot of information there that could be helpful to your planning. Uh, a little over 10% said of you said you're going to share the SCOLT conference registration details. And some said you're going to share the actual call for proposals, as well as the updates on the NCDLI team and advisory board. Great. Let's go ahead and take a look at the questions box. We had a couple questions that I think are important to talk about. Um, one person said, with the ACTFL call proposals, they know a lot of qualified teachers did not get accepted last year for presenting at ACTFL. And that is very true. The, um, the competition to get a proposal accepted at ACTFL is very uh, intense. I know at one point they said that less than half of the proposals submitted get accepted. And they limit you to usually to one proposal. Um, as, a, as the lead presenter, at least. Um, this person says, do you have any insight for those who want to present as to topics that might be underrepresented or more likely to be accepted? Um, what I would advise is that you carefully read the information on the actual uh, website that's linked from these materials today uh, that talks about presenter guidelines as well as submission details. So a lot of information in there about um, pertinent topics and ways to share your proposal so that it's clear to the reviewers what it is you want to present and why that's important and very relevant to our world language education field. 
So that's one thing always to think about. Um, I would also encourage you to, as always, um, look at things like uh, the topics that get presented at our state conference, the Flank Conference in the fall, um, to look at what gets presented at the Scope Conference and to carefully think about what it is that you want to share as a teacher or an administrator in world language education. Uh, one person is asking about the actual proposals. Will they be in English only or can we use the second language we teach? The proposal itself, as I understand it, must be in English because they are assigned to a variety of reviewers um, who could speak almost any uh, second, third, or even fourth language. Um, if you want to share something, though, obviously about the language you teach, you are encouraged to do so. And they do have a way for you to indicate on the actual proposal um, if you're focusing on one particular language and if you want to do your presentation in a language other than English, so in your second language. All right. I also had a person asking, they said, um, we do have a DLI advisory board for the state. Um, do we have a World Languages Advisory Board? And yes, we do. We actually have a World Languages Collaborative Team they are also representative uh, K-20 uh, um, from across the state of all of our language programs and the different levels and, and different ways in which students learn languages. Um, that World Languages Collaborative Team has a slightly different name, not an advisory board, but a collaborative team that was of their own choosing. We have had that team uh, since we um, implemented our new proficiency-based standards starting in 2012. And um, when we have openings on that team, just like with the DLI Advisory Board openings, I advertise an application and people can put in their application to be chosen. One of the ways to get chosen, obviously, is to make sure that you'll, you're filling a spot that we need for representation K-20. So again, that, that could be grade levels, that could be languages, that could be regions of the state, uh, that could be educator role, there's all kinds of things. So uh, when we need folks for that, just like with the DLI Advisory Board, we put out an application. All right, that looks like the majority of our questions now. So let's go ahead and move on with our broadcast so that we finish on time. If there are remaining questions, please go ahead and put those in, and I will definitely get to them before we um, sign off for today. All right, that brings us to our spotlight today. I always like to spotlight something that would be helpful for a majority of our field. And today we're looking at the Advanced Placement or AP World Language Exam results and resources from College Board. Keep in mind that many of the resources from College Board are helpful to all world language educators, regardless of what language you teach or whether you teach at uh, the AP level where you'd be giving uh, that course or exam. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, last year's second quarterly webinar actually featured our, a guest speaker from the AP College Board staff uh, for World Languages. However, they were not able to join us this year, but they gave me all of their materials, and I will go ahead and share those, uh, a little summary of that with you today, uh, and then you can get more details as you need to. So once again, we're starting with a poll question. I want to know what you already know. Which of these resources are available from AP College Board for all world language educators K-16? Take a moment and I'll go ahead and launch that question. You can check all that apply here, so consider what you know is available as a resource from the AP College Board. All right, let's go ahead and finish up our voting. Almost everyone has voted, so we'll take about another 10 seconds and then we'll see what people responded. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close our poll 
and then share the results with you. Well, well over half of you are aware of quite a few of these resources that are available. So it is true that there is annual data on AP World Language exam results, and I'm going to be sharing some of that with you today. Um, it is also true that they are complete released exams. There are online modules for world language educators that look specifically at pedagogy for the communication modes and other teaching strategies in a world language classroom. There's also going to be question banks and unit guides available from AP uh, College Board. And of course, there are teacher communities with discussion boards available to folks. So all of these things are available. And we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the details about that. Let's start with our AP World Language exam data for 2018. This is the national data you see here on this slide. It is taken from the slides that were shared at the actual session from AP. Uh, first and foremost, there were over 260,000 AP World Language exams given uh, during May of 2018 during the AP uh, testing window. You see on the chart there for AP exams in the U.S. and for the different uh, world language ones, how many total exams were administered as well as the percentage of students who scored three, four, or five on those exams. And typically um, on the AP grading scale, which is one to five, if you get a three, four, or five, it's a high enough score that you're considered to be quote unquote passing, but it's also a score that usually uh, ensures that students get college credit for that particular AP exam and, and, and subject area. There are eight different AP world language exams uh, right now. You see them listed there on the chart. Notice that seven different languages because Spanish has a Spanish language and culture exam as well as a Spanish literature and culture exam. Um, I shared um, on the slide here some brief trends that are happening with AP world language data. Um, first of all, over the course of five years, from 2014 to 2018, there's been an increase of 22% overall of the number of AP World Language exams being given. So this is a lot of growth over time. Nationally, the biggest increases from last year to this year, 2017 to 2018, were in Chinese, Italian, and both Spanish exams. The other exams or other languages show consistency or smaller increases than that. So that's something to think about. Um, notice that this slide is set up so that you can repurpose it as you need to. It has the U.S. flag so you know that this is obviously our national data. One thing I would suggest you do when looking at data, um, particularly because there's a lot of AP exam data that you can look at and really drill down into, is um, pick a language as we go through these slides to follow through so that you can look at each uh, thing we talk about from the perspective of one particular language or exam. All right, so let's move on. On the next slide, I have the same kind of information, but now for North Carolina. And I represent that with our North Carolina flag. In North Carolina, in May of 2018, there were 2,657 AP World Language exams taken. Um, our trends are similar to the U.S. data over the five-year period, but our biggest increases were in different exam areas slightly. So our biggest increases from 2017 to 2018 were in Chinese, French, Latin, and Spanish language exams. The other exams show small fluctuations um, in participation, but are relatively um, consistent over time. Notice that we've got the same information, the number of exams taken, and the percentage of exams that had a score of 3, 4, or 5. One thing to be aware of is that you do not see Italian on our list for AP exams in North Carolina, but it was on the national list. That is because in North Carolina this last year, um, no Ital AP Italian and culture exams were taken. That happens because Italian is um, a less commonly taught language in North Carolina. We do have a couple of Italian programs um, and certainly we have had AP Italian exam results in the past, but this particular year um, that did not happen. So it, it goes up and down. Do notice we have all of the other languages and exams that are given in North Carolina. Our AP Chinese exams, um, we have probably one of the highest number of exams in a state across the country. We have over 100. Last year we had 139 and a very high um, pass rate or 
rate of scoring a 3, 4, or 5 with 91%. We do have uh, AP French, and that number increased quite a bit. Um, over 50 more test takers in French this, this year in 2018 than last year, and roughly the, the same kind of pass rate. We have AP German exams uh, and AP Japanese. Uh, both the AP Japanese and AP Chinese exams were added by the College Board a little over 10 years ago. Uh, the other exams you see here have been in existence since um, almost the start of the AP program in the 1950s. Uh, you'll see that we have Latin and we have Spanish language and Spanish literature exams. So again, uh, this is just data to share with you. This tells you where we're at as a state and how we did in May of 2018. On the next slide, I've broken this information down a little bit more thoroughly so that you could study it and kind of see um, what would be most relevant to your work and in your thinking uh, about this data. So we have it broken down again by exam. Now they're running across the top of the chart instead of on the side. And then you see that we have the scores received, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, um, as well as the total number of exams just like we had before. One thing to notice is that we're also looking at the overall pass rate or the percentage rate of threes, fours, and fives overall on the right-hand side. This is a chart that has a lot of data to take in. And so um, one thing I've done with this slide is to make sure that we've kind of added some things that we can move on to when we're ready. So please take a look. Um, all of our numbers should match from the previous slide. And then um, the next row shows us out of that North Carolina total that we were just looking at, how many got a 3, 4, or 5, or 3 plus. And so notice that um, is where we're going to get that percentage. And so the last row has now that percentage overall, which you've seen for the individual language exams. But notice that we have an 81% rate overall of students getting threes, fours, or fives on world language exams in North Carolina. That's quite significant and I think it reflects the, um, the serious nature of our teachers and their programs and the students that are in them in making sure that they learn the content that they need to. And not just in their AP course. Um, as you know, building towards the level of proficiency needed to be successful in AP course or an AP world language exam um, starts when a student starts studying the language, whether that's earlier on in high school or in middle school or elementary. All right, so um, one thing to think about is, like I said, there's always more data to have. Um, the data you're seeing here comes from the online AP statistical tables, and in the notes section I have indicated um, the website that you can go to to get more, more data like this, and even additional data that looks at things like um, you know, what a standard test taker is versus a, uh, a regular test taker. Uh, there was someone asking before about um, how do you know how many um, native speaking students of a language or heritage students are taking, let's say, an AP world language exam. And that information is available. Um, they look at the data at the AP College Board differently depending on what a student's language background is. And so there's some additional information about that. And they specifically look at a standard student to be one who has learned their language in a, a classroom setting. Um, but they also calculate information for students who have exposure to the language at home or who perhaps have lived abroad for a significant period of time, which is something that um, you know, we have particularly with our military families and even with um, the way the world is globalized today, we have students who've lived abroad with their families. All right, so I'm going to take a quick look at our questions box to see uh, what we've got. All right, we did have one person say, why would a student take an AP course rather than taking, let's say, a community college credit course or something like that? Well, you know, that's a local decision and that's actually an individual decision for the student. Um, North Carolina is a local controlled state and so what that means is we have state standards that support any world language program K-12 including coursework that would lead up to an AP course 
and ultimately the AP World Language Exam. Um, but it's the decision of the local school or district or charter school to determine what is most appropriate to offer, whether that's the level of a course or the type of course um, or the environment for the course, whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. So it's all up to the student uh, and their school and what, what is available to them. We are seeing an increase um, in the taking of AP courses in North Carolina in general, not just in world languages, but certainly uh, in world languages too. And what we know is that's um, allowing students to earn, as I said, that college credit if they take the AP uh, exams and do well on them, get a 3, 4, or 5. Um, there's also some research out, in fact I saw an article just today, that talked about the benefits to students um, and the um, earlier college completion if they enter college with AP credits, as well as the lower cost to college if they enter with AP credits and then are able to use those um, to complete some of their requirements and not have to stay as long to take other courses in college. So there's a lot of information out there for that and actually um, I am planning in our third quarter webinar in January, at the end of January, to ask our North Carolina AP um, colleagues to, to come and share with us some of the partnerships that North Carolina has with the AP College Board and what that means for our students and teachers in providing opportunities like AP coursework and the preparation for that and how that can positively impact what we're doing with all of our students. All right, that's all the questions I see right now about AP. Let's go ahead and take a look at some resources that you can use as a teacher from AP College Board. There are complete released AP exams available for people to look at. Each released exam includes uh, the full exam itself, the audio files as appropriate, um, the answer key to the exam, and the scoring worksheet that's used. So all of the information essentially that an AP reader would have is available. Those released exams are posted on the AP course audit site. You see this link there, but uh, as always, I've got um, that full um, web address in the notes section of this slide, so you can get to that if you need to. And the complete released exams are accessible through the teacher's professional accounts with AP in order to keep that information secure, because again, it is test information, so obviously there's security around that. For AP World Language exams, um, the complete released exams are available or will be available soon in all eight of those uh, exams. So in the fall of 2016, a couple years ago, the AP Chinese and AP Japanese complete release exams were made available and are still available today. In the fall of 2017, the AP French and AP German um, complete release exams were made available. This fall, currently happening, AP Italian, AP Latin, and the AP Spanish Literature exams are going to have complete release exams. And next fall, uh, in 2019, the AP Spanish Language complete release exam will be available. In addition to complete release AP exams, of course, there are always practice exams available on the College Board website, as well as a number of other things relating to the um, course content for an AP course that would be preparation for the AP World Language exam. In addition to that, uh, the AP World Language folks at the College Board have created a series of interactive online modules that look at world language uh, instruction and pedagogy as well as program building. Um, and they have released those and made them available for free. And so again, there's a link here. You can go directly to that website and see all 12 modules. You see them on the left-hand side with their titles. A couple of things to note here. Um, the one in green, number 11, Developing Critical Reading and Literary Analysis for AP Spanish Literature, um, is actually the new one this year, new in 2018, but it is available. The other 11 have been available for some time, and actually the ones that appear in uh, yellow or gold there on the screen, uh, number one, Building an Effective Program, three and four, about strategies for maintaining student motivation and interpersonal communication with speaking, number six, with presentational communication for speaking, number 10 with interpretive communication and reading, and number 12, the reading and comprehending Latin text module. Those were all modules that were featured in the 2017-2018 North Carolina World Language Webinar series called Supporting Leading Edge Language Instruction. So we have a link to those obviously on our wiki. Um, all of that information is still posted from 2017-18. 
um, on our webinar series information page on the wiki where this information will be posted eventually for this broadcast. So you can always get to that, but know that we have been using those interactive online modules quite a bit already from College Board, and I would encourage everyone to take a look at those and think about those topics and how you could use those regardless of what language you teach um, or at what level you're teaching a language right now. Also, coming up soon in the 2019-2020 school year uh, from College Board are a series of AP question banks, unit guides, and other resources that could be helpful to teachers. And so I want to make you aware of them now so that you're uh, ready for those when they get published. There will be uh, several AP question banks released for all of the different AP exams, including the world language exams. The AP question banks contain actual AP exam questions as well as new formative items and it's in a searchable bank so that teachers can create assessments or assignments either online or on paper using the materials from the AP question bank. There will also be unit guides released. Uh, these are planning guides that outline the content and skills for major topic areas on, in each uh, AP course so that teachers can sort of focus and deepen their instruction on those topics. These are just guides. They are not a curriculum. They are guides to something that you could use in your AP coursework or other courses that you teach because these are good general topics and the kinds of things that we're all teaching about and want students to learn about as they build their skills in the language. There's also going to be some personal progress checks, and these are formative questions that, that use an AP exam task as a model um, for each unit, and they are there to provide feedback to teachers and students as to where they are so that you can focus teaching, learning, and practice um, for the AP course and exam. And finally, there are going to be some enhanced course and exam descriptions. No exams are changing. Um, that was emphasized a number of times in the session I attended on the AP World Language uh, um, courses, but there are going to be uh, additional details available about the course frameworks, the unit guides, the instructional strategies, and some suggested resources. So that's something to look forward to and think about. Also, there are AP teacher communities with discussion boards available from College Board. These online communities are where AP teachers discuss their teaching strategies, share resources, and connect with each other, as there is with any kind of discussion board or online community like that. Currently, all of the AP courses have um, a teacher community, including our eight AP World Language courses, um, and these communities also support AP coordinators. So you may uh, be an AP coordinator for your school, or you may know someone who is for your district. So they are supported through 32 different AP teacher communities with discussion boards. You see on the right-hand side, there's just a quick screenshot of that uh, and kind of what that landing page looks like when you go to that. All right, that's the end of our spotlight. I hope you've learned a little bit about our AP exam data for world languages as well as the resources available to you from College Board. I'm going to take a look and see um, if we have any questions, but I'm also going to remind you that the actual session presentation from our AP World Language contacts that was summarized here in the spotlight will be posted with this webinar's archive materials. There are well over 30 slides um, for you to dig into and, and link to resources with, so I have just summarized quickly um, what is there, but you can always go and find more information as you would like about those topics. All right, so I'm not seeing any questions about this. I do see a couple questions that I'm going to hold until the end um, because they may be more relevant to our, our wrap-up and reminders. With that, I'm conscious of our time. I think we're actually going to finish on time today, so let's move on. We are to the section of our webinar about reminders and resources. These are things for you to keep in mind or resources you may want to access or uh, access again if you've already been looking at them. First and foremost, I always like to remind everyone about the recent professional development that we've done uh, so that you know where the slides and other materials from those presentations are at in case you want to use them locally or you want to review them individually for some reason. Um, all of the DPI presentation materials from our Foreign Language Association of North Carolina, our FLANK annual fall conference, are now posted on the presentations page of our World Languages Wiki. And you see the links to that there. 
Um, obviously, Flank has its own website, and if you are a Flank member, you can access all the materials from the Flank Fall Conference, but I also like to post the things that I do for the state um, on the wiki, as well as share them on the Flank website, so that you can get to them as you need to. We had presentations about the Global Language Endorsement, North Carolina Sealed by Literacy. We had a World Language Update presentation in general at the state level, um, as well as some information about things like using data for advocacy um, and sharing um, progress on initiatives like um, the Global Educator Digital Badge. So all of that is available on that presentations page. Also, um, in October, just right after the fall, uh, the Flank Fall Conference, in fact, we had a webinar kind of like this, but in a different series. It's in the K-12 Program Showcase series, and it focused on classical language programs. It was on October 24th, and the broadcast materials from that presentation are posted on our webinar series information page of the World Languages Wiki, should you want to access them and use them. Another resource for us, of course, is our World Language Webinar Series that we're doing this year in 2018-19. That's what we're here uh, today for, in fact. Notice I have um, grayed out the presentations we've already done, but that means that the next um, webinar is in our Measuring World Language Proficiency Series. It's the one we talked about on credentialing, focusing on our Global Languages Endorsement. That's on December 5th. Uh, and after that, um, the, the next one will be January 30th. That'll be another uh, World Language Quarterly Update webinar. And finally, on February 20th, we're going to have another K-12 Program Showcase webinar. So uh, information about all of these and all the dates you see there are available on our World Language Information page uh, for webinars. And all of the registration links are also posted, so you can sign up. Here's a reminder. Um, seats are filling fast for the 7th International Conference on Immersion and Dual Language Education. North Carolina is hosting this international conference in February 2019. It will be February 6th through the 9th in Charlotte, North Carolina. You see the website there, and you can go over there and find out about things like school site visits to dual language immersion programs, uh, as well as pre-conference workshops, and two days full of sessions, plenaries, uh, and symposia related to dual language immersion instruction, K6, K20. Another resource for you is our World Language Listservs. I would encourage you to subscribe to any DPI listservs for World Languages or any other topic that you're interested in for your work. For World Languages, we have four different listservs. We have one for dual language immersion educators, one for North Carolina lingua folio, one for world language instructors, and one called World Language Education News. Each of these listservs comes with typically a monthly or um, periodic newsletter that comes out, as well as reminders and standalone announcements about opportunities, grants, professional development uh, events, and a number of other things that could be useful to you in your work as a world language educator. There are other DPI listers. In fact, there's a whole, there's literally dozens of them. Uh, there's ones for charter schools, for global education. There's one for legislative updates for K-12 education. There's one for teachers of English learners and so forth. So a lot of resources and information there that you can get delivered right to your email box. That finishes our webinar today. We have a few extra minutes to cover questions, which I'm glad of. Uh, once again, I have my contact information up there and name, uh, phone number, and email. want to remind everyone we do have an NCDPI World Languages Facebook page. would encourage you to uh, click on that and see what gets posted. Um, on the wiki, of course, um, under the webinar series information um, tab that's circled there on the right-hand side, that's where I will post the details from this broadcast, including our recording, um, these slides and our handouts and, and links to different uh, resources. And just a reminder, all of our NCDPI wiki spaces will be moving to a new home with Google Sites during this month so that they are ready for January 2019. All right, well that concludes our webinar for today. I'm going to go ahead and close out our recording, but I do see we have a couple questions, so I'll stay on the line to answer that.